Welcome to Letters from Norway, offering an American perspective from Oslo with your host, Nick Cameron. Okay, now the best part of the trip, you know, is always going to New York. Whenever I go home or everything, it's uh, New York is always my favorite place. It's uh, it's just a, it's a it's a great place. So most of you who are listening to this podcast, especially those from Norway, know all about New York. Everyone knows about New York. It's the most frequented city by Norwegian tourists to the U.S. You know, and then follow it's followed by Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco. So I don't need to give too much explanation or description about the city. It, it took, it's about an eight-hour drive from Virginia Beach, you know, if you leave four in the morning and beat the traffic jams, you know, get out before everyone else starts getting in the road. So it took me about eight hours to reach uh, Newark, New Jersey, which is close by the city, where I dropped my car off back at Hertz. And then I took Uber to get a ride to my cousin's place in Jersey City, which is across the bay from New York City. And it's only one metro stop. Jersey City is another one of these uh, great treasures of America. The service uh, works really well. I hadn't used Uber that often. I used it in Warsaw some weeks ago. But uh, the car came like right away. It was brand new. It was shiny. And and the guy was uh, joking around in a good mood. He was helpful with the luggage. It was way better than dealing with a taxi driver. It, it was it was a it was a very good experience. And you get to watch on the map on your phone, like where you are and where you're going. And you can even rate this guy like he's good at conversation or he knows the city or he's got a cool car. There's all kinds of different ways to do ratings on Uber. It's it's very uh, customer friendly. So it makes me wonder, how does an app that essentially automates hitchhiking can lose $700 million in one quarter? You know, this was uh, in recently written in all the newspapers, all the financial newspapers that they are basically spending as much money as NASA. Their losses are almost as much as NASA's uh, spending on a quarterly basis. Uh, the drivers may not be very, quote unquote, professional, but they are sure as hell courteous. And uh, like I said, they beat out taxi drivers every time. So I don't, I don't know how they lose money. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a mystery to me. Uber in a sense, will be the universal replacement to the taxi dispatch service. That's the value added that the taxi companies give to the drivers, that they can get the leads and uh, get, you a, get you a client. And Uber has done all of this you know, on a server. You know, instead of having rooms full of uh, people and all of this, it's, it's just an app. You know, so I, I hope the governments let this succeed. It will put more money into the middle class because the taxi drivers right now don't get actually that much money. Most of it goes to a dispatch company. Most of it goes, to, a lot of it goes to regulations and what have you. So this will kind of democratize the taxi business and everyone can become a taxi driver when they need a little extra money time to time. You know, they just have to meet the Uber's criteria. So I, I hope I hope they don't uh, kill this. It's, it's, it was worked really, really well. Much easier than calling a cab. And I, I hope they figure out, I hope Uber company figures out how to stop losing money all the time. <laughs> you know, maybe they're burning it on driverless car R&D, but it would be tragic to see them go. So after I caught up with my cousin, it was time to go to the city and get some jewelry for my wife and then have lunch with an old friend uh, who is also a, co a former colleague. Uh, we met, uh, we were looking for a restaurant, but it seemed like nothing opened up till 1130. And I did the Norwegian thing, you know, ask him, let's meet early at 11, you know, so I could get a head start on my day and have lunch at 11. So we finally walked around and walked around until we find Chipotle. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know how we ended up there with all the wonderful restaurants in New York, but I guess nothing was really opened. But over lunch, he confirmed to me that the Wall Street firm that we both worked at worked at is still a sweatshop. You still come in 6.30 in the morning and you're there till, you're supposed to leave at four, but most people stay till eight or nine because always something is not right and something has to be fixed and your head is on the chopping block. So nothing has changed that way. You're still working a lot of hours in New York and have a lot of responsibility in your job. You know, it's not like uh, people think, like people are taking coffee breaks and long lunches. 
what what they do there is that if the job is uh, takes five people to do, they find a way to get three people to do it, and then roll those profits uphill. So you are actually working every single minute of every single hour of every single day that you're in that office. Nobody is uh you know hanging around like you would like I've heard I've heard people in Norway say yeah the Americans really don't work those hours. That is complete BS. They they are working very hard those hours because what they are trying to do is do the job of two other people themselves. So, you know, how do you get out of this? So like many people in New York, uh, my friend and I, you know, former colleague as well, we would pool our money together for lottery tickets. You know, and we had three, four other people in this uh, little click of ours. Anytime the jackpot was over $100 million. So we would then put our money together, go buy lottery tickets. And, you know, that, that little rush of hope kind of got you through the week. You know, because the lottery getting over $100 million is now getting more and more common. It used to be very rare, but $100 million payouts are quite good. So after the taxes, you would have $50 million, and then you divide that two, three ways. It's enough to, like, get out of that meat grinder. So we caught up on that. And I was always thinking they should make an app for that, like a lottery pools app, where you can join and, you know, you put in money and you're in a pool with people who are feeling, you know, the corporate oppression like yourself. So that's just another idea for the aspiring entrepreneurs. On the way back, after I went to the jewelry district, uh, I decided to do things out of order. I was in the jewelry district, and I went to lunch. I went back to the jewelry district, and then it was time to get back to Jersey City. So on the way back, I stopped at the 9-11 memorial. And every time I see this uh, memorial, it really takes me back to the day when this all happened. You know, I was working at in Chicago at the corporate headquarters of Sears when this happened, and I was fresh out of the Navy. And, you know, I was at a new job learning how to become what was called a Six Sigma black belt. This is like a project manager who uses uh, statistical methods and teaches it to his uh, team members who are line managers how to improve company profitability. It's like, how do you measure poor quality and then how do you make things better? It's a, it's a very uh, mathematical approach uh, to solving problems. And, and somehow that day in Hoffman Estates, you know, when we were watching, you know, how the planes had hit the building, we all figured out among ourselves that the best thing we could do to fight terrorism was get back to work and give it our all, that we would have to work extra hard because that's what would keep us strong. The terrorists, at the end of the day, not only wanted to kill all those people, but they wanted to destroy our economy and make us uh, fight among ourselves. So through hard work, uh, we decided as a team that we would fight back. You know, we would work really hard. We wouldn't let this uh, get to us. Or if it did, you know, we would just take it out through work. And that week, we all put in so many extra hours, and everybody was so cooperative. And we said, this is what we have to do. We have to make Sears as profitable as possible so they can pay those taxes. And that way, we can fund that military to get those people back. But the greatest tragedy of 9-11 is that America has forever moved from an open and easy culture to a security state where people are, in general, have become more guarded and less trusting. That to me is one of the greatest tragedies. It has changed our national personality. For some reason, we are not, uh, have moved past this, you know, like we did with uh, Pearl Harbor. You know, once World War II was over and everything, it seemed like we moved past and we went back to being our old selves. But this time it's, it seems different, that we're still in this like uh, state of fear and state of anxiety. And maybe that's also due with the economy never really recovered either. We started going down the globalist path about that time as well, giving more and more of ourselves abroad. So I, I don't know. I, I hope people don't remain suspicious of each other and instead be more open, giving each other the benefit of the doubt like they did before. It was always before assuming the most optimistic thing, and now people have a you know initial pessimistic assumption. For sure, though, solving the terrorism issue won't be solved with political correctness and uh, liberal diplomacy, you know, trying to appease the Middle East. That is not going to solve our problem. That will do actually the opposite. You know, it makes us look like fools that after they do something like this, we go try to appease them. The terrorism cannot be solved, like I said in my previous podcast, until that their ideology is reformed and those in charge of uh, these countries uh, stop endorsing terrorists, stop giving them money for suicide bombings, you know, directly or indirectly. You know, sometimes by not saying nothing, they're giving indirect support. That's where the change has to come from. 
And the only way we can bring about that change is by stop engaging with them as much as possible. You know, hit them where it hurts in the pocketbook. Otherwise, we will be in the state of perpetual wars, uh, living in a constant state of fear. Perhaps uh, we have to take this responsibility among ourselves, getting to know our neighbors, like I discussed also in the previous podcast, that we can't rely on the state for everything. We have to just go on and be ourselves. So I went back to Jersey City, you know, and I, uh, with my cousin, you know, he met me at the Pace station. I think it's uh, either the New Jersey Transit or Pace. It's something like that. Uh, we went for a walk on the, um, you know, waterfront and you get a great view of New York City, you know, uh, looking looking uh, east. And then you get a, looking south, you get a nice view of the Statue of Liberty. And he said, you know, my cousin immigrated from India to, uh, you know, study. He studied at University of Illinois, and then he took a uh, job at Deutsche Bank. But, you know, it's been his dream to always have an apartment that faces the Statue of Liberty, that he wants to see that every morning. I thought that was fantastic. You know, and he is like me. He knows everything about America and about the history. And, uh, you know, he never wants to go back. You know, it's uh, he, when he goes back for visits, he's also very reluctant, you know, like myself. You know, it's only to see family, get in, get out. You know, try not to uh, stay any longer than you have to. But what you see from this view from Jersey City is that New York City at night, you see all the buildings are on. You know, the lights in the office buildings are on, that people are working. And you realize that, America works because America works. And you know that everyone in those offices, they're not, they're, they're really working hard, you know, to, to make things happen, you know, and trying to get their dreams. And you realize from looking at it from this angle, it's really a great city. Okay, so now finishing off the story, uh, you know, I have some reflections and realizations here, you know, after my trip to America and then, you know, putting this in context of the Trump trip. You know, his trip was obviously probably more exciting than mine. But I'll, I'll tell you, I'll try to tie it together, what I experienced and the Trump trip. So despite all the problems and all the infighting, I, I still believe this to my heart, that America is the greatest country on earth. And we should always believe that as Americans. That's our edge. You know, this this whole humility and servitude and servility thing, it's, it's, it's a crock of crap believe that because it's it's true you know especially when you've lived in Norway I've lived in quote unquote the best country in the world and I've come to what is really the greatest country in the world there's a difference between greatest and the best and and greatest is really something that's awesome so you only need to look you know to confirm this you only need to look in front of any US embassy anywhere in the world even in the countries where they hate us and you'll always see a line of people you know, trying to get in. And people, when they have a few beers, even the anti-Americans when will tell you it's their secret wish to be in the U.S. And the more they say they don't like America, it's probably because they got rejected or didn't get into a school there or they went there to work and couldn't cut it. You'll always find out there's a backstory. And another thing I really realized when I was in America is that we're only running on one third of our true potential, just like we only have one third support you know, true support for the president and for, for a pro-American agenda and a patriotic agenda. It's also with our potential that uh, the way we work and how we do things, our overall collective health, we're only operating on one third of our potential and we're able to achieve this much, you know, still being the greatest country on earth, the biggest economy per capita, or I shouldn't say per capita, but overall the gross domestic product. You know, per capita, it's like little countries like Luxembourg where they got like five people or something and they're all doing banking and they can juice the statistics. But really, when you look at, you know, all the achievements and the engineering and the people, you know, the Google, the Apple, the aircraft carriers, the planes in the air, you know, the civil engineering that we have done going to the moon, it's, it's really astounding, you know, when you take a step back and look at what this country has done in like less than 300 years. You know, and the millennials I talk to, seem to understand that there is something wrong, but they don't understand uh, the globalist agenda to remove our borders and remove our way of life, you know, take our constitution away and take us to a more of a global standard. They don't seem to understand that. Maybe a few of them who have traveled. Uh, they seem lost, you know, the millennials I've talked to, that they lost their sense of national identity, you know, that uh, they don't feel like they're an American, they just feel like they're some person, like with a social security number. And I think this happened because American history was written out of the curriculum. People don't say the pledge anymore. It's uh, 
you know, becoming less and less fashionable to sing the national anthem, it appears. I don't know what's gone wrong, but people really don't learn about the concept of America. You know, we used to read a lot of American literature. We used to read a lot of American history when I was growing up. And it was actually interesting, and you would want to go and read more of this on your own, I thought. You know, it was, it was fun. So we need to put that back in the schools. Uh, the only oversensitive American millennials I've ever met that were really anti-American are the ones that seem to be living or traveling abroad, thinking that they can escape. However, I have never met any of those people who've been living here for a long time you know, these uh, anti-American Americans, you know, living in Norway or living in Sweden or wherever. I never actually seen any of them give up their passports and swear an oath to Norway or swear an oath to Sweden or Denmark. They still hang on to their American citizenship, despite the double taxation, despite all the reporting rules that you have to do. They still hang on to that passport because deep down inside, they know what is true. They, they know. They, they, I think they know the truth, and maybe they're just having some problem with themselves and they're taking it out on their country. It's just like what people do with their parents. You know, If they're frustrated, sometimes they just take it out on their parents. But what really bothered me in America, what I really saw, and it has been going on as long as I've been alive since, the 19, you know, since 1970, is the obesity and overweight people. You know, and now we're getting into a fat acceptance culture. This is the crisis that is staring us in the face, and this is what is killing us. Uh, I mean, our economy is being disabled, people's lives are being ruined, and now they're trying to glamorize this. You know, we need to find a clever way to help these people, and this will be a topic of discussion in a future podcast, you know, discussing the American food crisis, the overabundance of cheap and easy food that is uh, killing us. So I will make that a whole podcast by itself because I lost a ton of weight when I came to Norway by changing some habits, you know. So we'll discuss that. That's out of the topic of this. So, but my final thought here is that if just 20% of American people got themselves into an average physical shape and became aware of the world out there and what the possibilities are when you have uh, good health, I couldn't even imagine how much more prosperous we would be as a country, you know, running at 50% of our potential. Just imagine America running at using half its potential instead of one third where it is now, what, what that effect would be on the economy. I mean, let alone, I couldn't even fathom what we would be at 100% of our potential. Uh, on that note, I always tell people, I used to work at an investment bank that specialized in emerging markets, but I used to always tell my clients that the greatest emerging market story out there, better than the BRICS, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, or the next 11, which are all these little small countries like Vietnam and Pakistan and Cambodia, the best emerging market story out there is the United States of America. You know, uh, we have the benefits of a developed country, you know, rule of law, transparency, you know, combined with this unrealized potential in our people. You know, hence, there is a huge upside potential for anyone who wants to invest in America. And policymakers should see this. If they just made some small changes in policy and made some information more transparent, uh, we, we could be in a huge boom. This 4% figure that Donald Trump is going for would be left in the dust. We would be growing like... Uh, you know, India or Vietnam was, you know, 10 years ago, just by leaps and bounds, double digits, you know, it would just be amazing. So, uh, you know, on this trip, you know, affirmed to me that President Trump did the right thing. He reaffirmed our position in the world, that America must stand apart and above from the world and not with it, like before. You know, this is how we were before. We always stood above and apart. And that led to our greatness as a nation. And this kind of thinking will lead to our revival. And it will actually be for the betterment of the whole world. The world will benefit from this much better than it does with a servile and uh, subordinate America. It has to be this way for our democracy and freedom. You know, otherwise it'll perish. You know, we will lose our democracy and freedom if it is not like this. Uh, we not only have the ideological core, but also the collective decisiveness to keep the peace. American leaders make decisions while others waffle. The EU is a very confused state. These leaders in Brussels are constantly conflicted between their own national agendas of their respective nations and the one of the EU, which is mostly driven by the Germans, by Angela Merkel. We can see that Poland and Hungary and, and the Brexit are signs of this, that uh, 
they are not, you know, that they're not in agreement, that things are gone very wrong there. You cannot serve two masters. It creates confusion, and that is very evident right now. That was uh, demonstrated in the Kosovo conflict. Right there in their own backyard, there's a genocide going on, and they couldn't figure out how to send in troops and solve it, so the Americans had to do it. The UN, which is, uh, you know, the short name for unable, you know, the first two letters uh, in the word unable is UN, you know, keep that in mind. And the Crimea conflict, there it is again, right in uh, Europe's backyard. The Russians uh, hacked Europe. Instead of sending in like an overt uh, military force, they created an insurgency. You know, just by taking the patches off the soldiers' uniforms, they were able to create mass confusion. You know, because then that's the difference between an invasion and an insurgency, simply is the name tape on the uniforms and the country uh, flag. <laughs> you know, so Europe uh, couldn't figure out what was going on in Ukraine, and uh, Russia was able to just walk right in and do what they wanted. And so this, again, proves that Europe's cannot make decisions in times of need. And, you know, my wife will like this one. When I was uh, in Ukraine, the journalist asked me, what do you think of Ukraine joining the EU? I went off on that reporter. I said, the EU should be trying to join the Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine should, like, want nothing to do with those losers. You know, they're going to lose their whole country if they get into that, that federation. Only thing, difference between the Soviet Union and the European Union is the word in front of union. That is about the only difference between the two unions is the word in front. Otherwise, they're going to just have as many problems. They're better off going at it on their own. They have agriculture. They have aerospace. They have a ton of industry. They have a lot of smart people. That Kiev Polytechnic University puts out much better engineers than anywhere else in Europe. Maybe a few schools in Germany can rival that. But the people coming out of a, that Kiev Polytechnic and the school in Kharkiv, they're way up there. And a lot of them are working in Silicon Valley in America, you know, proving that point. Matter of fact, Igor Sikorsky, the inventor of the helicopter, came from Kiev Polytechnic Institute. Uh, to further that, that furthers my point that, uh, you know, Europeans like to play parliament. And they're more about the process and the procedures than actually getting a result, getting a quick and decisive result. And that is a fundamental difference between the rest of the world and America. You know, that is a fundamental cultural difference between America and the rest of the world. Why does a country with like 4% of the world's population, you know, produce one third of its GDP and output and have almost half its patents? I mean, we used to have more than half the patents every year, just one nation. We would have more patents than all other nations combined. Now I think we're right at 49%, something like that. I mean, it's just mind blowing what we are and we should be proud of that. Uh, we just like to get it done you know, taking on as much as we can and just going after it. They like to hold meetings and then they like to have meetings to arrange the next meetings. And everyone in those meetings is trying to push responsibility off to someone else. That is Europe. No one should want to be a part of that European Union. It's, it's just a, it's a disease. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a too strong of a word. But, you know, if I were the Ukrainians or, you know, Moldovans or any other people, I would be like looking at that like I want to stay the hell away from that mess. You know, so... Exiting the Paris Agreement, that was long overdue. It had absolutely nothing to do with saving the planet and all to do with shackling America. There is nothing in that Paris Agreement that would save polar bears and stop icebergs from breaking off. It was a pure mess of politics. It was a stack of bull crap, you know, a stack of papers amounting to bull crap. You know, um, they should rename this G7 to America and the Globalist Six Pack. You know, I mean, <laughs> we are not part of this G7. We're America, and they're like the globalist six-pack. You know, the, the hell with that. Uh, th that agreement, that Paris Agreement, covertly transferred our industry abroad and circumvented all the rules of competition and marketplace. Uh, my only regret about that decision is that President Trump didn't kill it on Inauguration Day. I think his ratings would have gone through the roof if he gave that speech on Inauguration Day after his other speech. If we had, you know, but it's probably hard to give two great speeches on the same day, you know. <laughs> you know so, but it happened. It's great. Um, America has now finally made that uh, break from the world, just like those icebergs breaking off. You know that we are America, and the rest of the world is the rest of the world. It has to be that way. You know, it. it what really irks me too about this Paris Agreement and the NATO coverage you know, where President Trump asked NATO to pay up is that uh, the media always refers to our allies as counterparts. That is bull. That is bull. They are anything but. America, like I said, and I've said over and over again, we stand above the rest. 
It is uncomfortable thought for some, but perhaps it is so true. We have always been and always will be the best and always ahead of everyone else. Those European countries and all our allies are subordinates, which we have to babysit and bail out. Look at World War I, World War II, the Cold War, Kosovo, like I mentioned before, and now this Ukraine thing. It's always us at the front of this, and even with North Korea. I mean, it's always us in the front. You know, they, they haven't earned that status to be on the same level as us. They, they've been completely ineffectual. And we will never lose their support by being arrogant because the, the consequences, you know, are far too dire for them to stand on their own. And they know that, you know, <laughs> you know, trying to make America like Europe will kill the planet. Once America is lost, the forces of evil will take over. And, and, and they know that. The Europeans know that um, the factions from within their own country will never reach a decision in time to respond to an invasion or insurgency, just like in Kosovo or Crimea. Do, uh, do you think Russia, China, and Iran running the world would give a shit about the environment? No. <laughs> Can you imagine a world run by those three clowns? You know, that would really, that would really be something. Uh, you, should, you should see the deals they got in the Paris Agreement. Why do, you, why do you think the Chinese are supporting the Paris Agreement still? Because they get to increase pollution every year. The, the Russian standards for the Paris Agreement also allow them to keep building and mining coal. And how do you even know what they're doing? I mean, you don't even, they don't even have real elections. And, and Iran, we don't even know what's going on in there. They can do whatever they want because as soon as you say the wrong thing there, they chop your head off. So, you know, how great was this agreement? And, and especially when other countries get to raise emissions, it's totally crazy. An independent, strong, and all-powerful America is what keeps the world at peace. Even Russia, North Korea, and China need a strong America so they have a legitimate enemy on which their regimes can justify their oppression and military spending. They even need us. They because we're their boogeyman. You know, we're a credible boogeyman. You know, I mean Russia can't say that Moldova is their enemy or something, then people will stop believing in in the regime. But if they have America as an enemy, that's a pretty credible threat. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> If any, and I want to just reach out to any of you scientists. I don't know if you get to the end of this podcast, you know, but any of you scientists out there that are thinking about moving to France and taking Marcon's invitation or moving to any other European country in general, you'll have to learn a new language, you know, so that'll distract your scientific work because you'll be, you know, tired, you know, all night learning language and everything, and you'll never get to do your science work. And you'll have to pay a lot of taxes. And then you'll work in a Machiavellian corporate culture where people are always screwing and backstabbing you all the time and nothing will get done. It'll be all about planning meetings and more meetings. And then you'll be like, oh yeah, that's why I lived in America because people don't care where I'm from or how I do it. They just want the results. You know, so while you're living there in Europe, you'll see your work decimated and then you'll come back home as a, as a massive conservative. Okay, closing thoughts on this two-part podcast. Uh, take note. Uh, that these ideals, America standing above all nations, is nothing new. In the 1936 Berlin Olympics, with Hitler presiding, it was only America that did not dip their flag to them, to the Nazis. Old glory stood tall, and the Americans had their uh, hands over their chest, while all the other countries dipped their flags and waved a one-arm salute to Hitler. This is who we are. It's always been this way, and it should always be this way, and the world as a whole will benefit. So with that, I'm closing this podcast. I would like to thank everyone for listening. I would hope that you can like and subscribe to us on social media and uh, iTunes. And we're going to keep uh, putting out more podcasts. I'm really starting to get into this and enjoy it. I just hope we can pick up an audience and get the message out. Please refer to the uh, show notes for all the references. And, the, and I got even some pictures from the trip on there that you'll find quite interesting. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and follow us on social media. 